Good morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. He is worthy of praise. Amen. Have you come to worship this morning? Oh, my goodness. Have y'all come to sing a song unto the Lord? To shout glory to his name. That's what we've come to do. So you know this. This is a real uh, uh, a hymn of the church. Just join in with us. Say, down at the cross, down, down at the, the cross, cross, where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing. Down where for cleansing from sin I cry. There to my heart was the blood there of life. to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. Saved from sin. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides with me. Jesus within. so sweetly abides with me. There at the cross where He there took me. There at the cross where He took me. Glory to His name. What? 
blessed Savior. Jesus, oh, yeah. blessed Savior. He's worthy to be He's praised. Worthy to be praised. Oh, God is our rock. God is oh, yes, he is. our rock. Hope of salvation. Hope of salvation. We do praise him. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Praise him, Jesus.
the Lord. Morning, Chase. Let's put our hands together. We came to praise the Lord this morning. We're going to use four words and we're going to praise the Lord. Come thou almighty king. Come thou almighty king. Help us, help us thy name. Come thou almighty. Come thou almighty. Help us thy name. Help us thy name We've come to praise. We've come to praise. We've come to praise. Come to praise. Come to praise. Thy name. Come thou, come thou, Lord. Help us thy name. name We've come to praise. We've come to praise. We've come to praise. 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 Thy name. name. Sopranos, sopranos. Clap your hands, everybody. You can have a good time in the Lord. Oh, yeah. Help us, Come thou almighty. Come thou almighty. Help us, Let's hear from the tenors. Tenors. Help us, thy name. Help us, thy name. Oh, yeah. Come thou. Come on, basis. Come thou almighty king. Oh, yeah. Help us thy name speak. Come on. Come thou almighty king. <laughs> Help us thy name to speak. Everybody sing. Come thou almighty king. Help us thy name. Come to praise thy name. For all victorious, come reign, Lord. One more time. Father victorious. Father all glorious, or all victorious, come rain, Lord. Father or all victorious, come and rain. We've come to praise. We've come to praise. We've come to praise. The 
name, the name, the name, the name, the name, the name, the name, the name, the name, the name, the name, the name, Righteous is your name, and holy is your name. For thy name is righteousness, Lord, and thy name is holiness, Lord. We've come to praise. We've come to praise. Thy name. Oh, praise the Lord, the church say amen. 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 We want to thank the Young People's Choir. Praise the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Man, y'all were singing. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, I have uh, quite a few scripture this morning, kind of uh, quite a few scriptures. So um, if you have your Bibles, you know I want you to get them ready or you got an app on your phone. Um, what have you going to have it on the screen? Uh, but I just want us to look at some things together. I, I feel uh, like this is a foundational sermon. You know, since the beginning of January, well, the end of January, up until last week, we were talking about faith. And now we're going to talk about something else. And so I want to have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll get right into it. Eternal God, our Father, once again, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness to us. It is true that you have been better to us than we have been to ourselves. You have looked out for us, Lord. You've healed us. You've redeemed us. You've empowered us. You've set us free from those things that have us in bondage. And we want to thank you right now, Lord. We are grateful for all that you have done for us. And now, Lord, uh, as we open the book, help us to clear our hearts. Help us to clear our minds so that we might receive of uh, what you have said in your word, even though it's coming through me, an imperfect vessel, Lord. I pray that your word will resound loud and clear in our hearts. And even as Moses ascended on the mountain and he humbled himself, he took off his shoes and he bowed down before you. Likewise, Lord, we humble ourselves. We ask that you would speak to us right now. Speak to us, Lord, in uh, the name of Jesus. Uh, let the church say amen, amen, amen. All right, my brothers and sisters, the subject of our sharing this morning is a life of dominion. A life, yes, of dominion. And this morning, quite frankly, I hope I'm instrumental in helping us to gain a better understanding of our role right now as the people of God in this world. I want us to understand the role that we currently have right now as the people of God in this world. And in order to do this, we're going to have to look at why God created us in the first place. And what are we doing or what should we be doing, my brothers and sisters, to fulfill uh, God's purpose in our lives? In other words, I want you to think about this. How does your life and your current behavior answer the question, why am I here? How does your current life, your current behavior answer the question, why am I here? Am I here? or computer anal analyst or store manager or a successful business owner? Uh, does my occupation uh, answer the question of why I'm here or does it fulfill my purpose for being here on this earth? Or does my occupation or where I live or how much money I make or uh, the crowds that I hang with, does that define who I am? Well, let's see what the Word of God has to say about all of this. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and many of you know this, we all know it, Genesis, if you've been in church any length of time. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the what? The heavens. Now, that's plural. God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, in other words, God created 
uh, spiritual places, plural, the heavens, and he created a physical place called the earth. And we can assume from our understanding of the scriptures, we can assume uh, that the heavens or the spiritual places are where the angels and where the fallen angels and derivatives of their kind are designed to live. And the earth is where uh, mankind is designed to live. Now, Psalm 115 verse 16 says this. It says, the highest of the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind, or as the King James Version says, he has given to the children of men. Now, that scripture right there is very important. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, all right, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So, so in other words, the highest heavens are God's domain. The highest heavens belong to him. He rules there. Uh, he has complete authority there. His will is being done in the highest heavens without question, right? And I believe the reason it says the highest heavens is because, my brothers and sisters, when you read the scripture, we find out that there are different levels uh, to the heavenly places. Uh, for example, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 2, he tells us that he was caught up in a vision to the third heaven. Do you hear that? He was caught up to the third heaven where he heard things that were inexpressible and he was not permitted to share with the people of this world, right? And so apparently there are different levels that make up the heavenly places. But the highest of those levels, the highest of the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth, he says... In Psalm 115, he said, the earth he has given, he has gifted, he has created, he has made for the children of men. And like the highest of the heavens belong to God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the earth belongs to mankind. And we are here to exercise our authority and our rulership, our dominion over the earth. So let's take a time, let's right now look at Genesis chapter 1. Uh, verses 26 through 28. Now, now, this says something about our purpose, about our reason for being here. This verse right here. Then God said, it's right there on the screen. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. The King James Version says, so that they may have dominion, over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Let's keep going, all right? So God created mankind in his own image. That's very important. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, for God, God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and do what? And subdue it. Rule over or have dominion over the fish in the sea and the birds uh, in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. All right. So, so right here, this scripture tells us that God created us to have dominion, that is to have mastery, to have control to have authority over the earth. In verse 27, he said, fill the earth and subdue it. To subdue it means to bring it under your control. Bring it under your power. Bring it under your dominion because your dominion, your rulership will be or it ought to be a reflection of my authority. So one of the reasons, my brothers and sisters, for being created was to be in the image or the reflect, was to, was to be the image or the reflection of God's authority on this earth. That's one of the reasons why we create. In addition to having fellowship and being in partnership with God, we were created for dominion, all right? In other words, just like God has complete control, he has complete control over the highest heavens, we are to have, who are made in his image, are to have complete control over this earth. And our control, our dominion, again, uh, should reflect God's way of doing things because he is the one who gave us the earth in the first place and he is the one who made us in his image, right? Now, if you're ahead of me, you may be 
saying to yourself, you may be asking the question, well, isn't man the dominant species? Are we not the dominant species on this earth? Uh, doesn't mankind already rule this earth? Aren't men and women really over the nations as it stands? So why are we going over this? Well, the answer to those questions, my brothers and sisters, in reality, from God's perspective, is no. Man is not the present monarch of this earth. Why? Because 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says that the entire world lies under the influence of the evil one. That's what it says. 1 John chapter 5, verse 90 says that the entire world lies under the influence of the evil one. And see, that's why Jesus was crucified. He was crucified because he represented the values of another world that is called the kingdom of God or, like the Bible says in Matthew, the kingdom of the heavens. Jesus was crucified. Because he was sent here to take power away from Satan and give it back to mankind. And because of that, Satan could not allow that to happen. And so he influenced the people of Jesus' day to kill him. Now, the reason Jesus had to come, or you could say it this way, the reason that God the Son came as a man, he came, my brothers and sisters, listen to me, to take back what had been stolen from us because Adam and Eve were deceived. They were tempted into relinquishing or giving their authority to the devil. You see, that's, that's what the story of Genesis chapter 3 is all about. It's about how the enemy tempted both the man and the woman to disobey and to rebel against God as he had. And that's how Satan became, uh, as Jesus said, the prince of this world. Do you remember what Jesus said in John, the 14th chapter, verse 30? I will remind you. On the last night that Jesus was with his disciples, he said, he said, I will not say much more to you. He said, because the prince of this world is coming for me. He has nothing in me. He has no hold over me. But he is coming so that the world may learn that I love the Father and that I will do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Now, I know that this may be elementary for some of you, but just bear with me for a while. Just, just hold on right now, all right? So right now, my brothers and sisters, even though Jesus, the Bible says, has reversed some things by his death and by his resurrection, the Bible says that currently now the ruler or the prince of this world is Satan, even though his time is drawing to a close. Sometimes I think that we... We are somewhat misled when we, when we sing the song, he's got the whole world in his hands. Yes, the Father is the creator, but right now the Bible says the entire world lie, the governments of this world, they lie under the influence of the evil one, right? This evil one, Satan, the devil, he is the puppet master behind the curtains, pulling the strings on everyone who doesn't believe in who Jesus is or what he did on the cross. He's the puppet master. Listen, I don't care who you are, but if you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross and that he set you free from the dominion of sin, I want you to understand that you are under the influence of the puppet master. And Jesus said that this angelic being is a thief. And he said in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, and he comes only. Uh, his sole purpose is to steal, to kill and destroy. And if you want to know why there is so much injustice and why there is so much suffering in this world, then there is your answer. The Lord said that the thief comes, the enemy has come to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Huh? Uh, when you think about all of the wars that have happened upon this earth in the last century, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, uh, the, the Vietnam War, Desert Storm, Desert Shift, all of those, if you want to know why all of those things happened, then you just look to the evil one. As a matter of fact, you might ask, perhaps you have asked the question, why do good people suffer? Why do the same reason that Jesus suffered, right? Because John 3, 19 says, light 
has come into the world, but the people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. The light represents the Lord Jesus. The darkness represents the enemy. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, just to try to prove my point from the scriptures, Satan himself admitted that he was the prince of this world when he tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. Yes, he did. If you look at Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 5, he was with Jesus in the wilderness and, and he tried to tempt him, the second temptation. Look at what it says. It says, the devil led Jesus up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. All right? And he said to him, look at what, look at what the enemy said to our Lord. He said to him, I will give you. How, did, how, was, he able, how was he able to say it? He said, I will give you all of their authority. I will give you all of their splendor. Talking about the kingdoms of the world. Look at it. He says, it has been given to me. What does he mean? He said, it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Huh? He, who gave it to him? Who gave him that authority? Huh? Who gave him the authority over the world? It was none other than our four parents. That's what Adam and Eve, that's what that was about. Genesis chapter 3. Do you see the connection I'm trying to make as we build this thing? But now, but okay. But now, having read what the scripture said in Genesis, we just talked about it. having read what the scriptures said in Genesis, would you not agree that it is still God's will for us? To have dominion, to have mastery, to have control, to have authority over the earth. And authority now that represents God. Would, would you not say that? Hmm, hmm, hmm. I mean, even though the, enemy, even though the enemy, enemy interrupted God's plan, do you think that God has changed his mind about what he wants to see happen on this earth? Do you think that God has somehow changed his mind, uh, that he has decided, well, the enemy got in my way, I can't use the people of this world anymore? Do you think God is that way? Let me put it another way. Let's make it personal. Let's make it personal. Even if you were to mess up in some way, and many of us have already messed up in life in various ways, let me ask you this question. You've been here in the church for a long time. Uh, you've heard me preach about the gospel of grace. Do you think that God still wants you to get it right even though you messed up? I mean, I, I hope that you think that God is not just going to scrap his plans for your life just because you messed up. I hope you don't think that God is someone who gives up so easily when things do not go his way. You might give up. I might give up when things don't go my way, but God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Bible says what he started in you, he will bring to its completion. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now let me ask you this. Let's make it even more personal. For those of you who are parents, when your children mess up, when your children mess up, no matter how bad it might be, right, in your heart of hearts, if you love them, then don't you want them to eventually get it right? Am I not accurate when I say that? Okay, now, well, let me tell you this. God wants us to get it right, huh? And God's going to hang in there with us, and he's going to stick in there with us until we get it right. God sent Jesus to give us a head start, as a matter of fact, on getting it right, on getting it right, huh? Not only did he model and show us how we ought to live and show us how we ought to defeat the enemy. But this is how Jesus helps us, or helped us to get it right. He died for us. He shed his blood so that we might be forgiven of all of our sins, so that our slate might be wiped clean, so that the list of our disobedient acts, our rebellious act, might be deleted from the program, deleted from our computer screen, and not counted against us, huh? But that's not all he's done for us. Not only did he shed his blood, not only did he die so that we might get it right, not only did he die, not only does his blood wipe away all of our sins, not only does his blood separate our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. But the Bible says, the Bible says that he was raised from the dead so that through the Holy Spirit he could live in us and he could lead us and guide us into all truth. The Bible says that he was raised from the dead uh, so that we would not be alone 
against the forces of the enemy. The Bible says that he was raised from the dead so that he could help us and comfort us and pray for us and encourage us along life's journey. Does not the Bible say that right now Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf? Do you get what I'm trying to say, my brothers and sisters? Huh? He was raised from the dead so that you and I can grow into the authority and the power that God wanted us to have in the first place. I'm saying to you that God wants you to walk in authority and power. That's what I'm saying. And Jesus, there's a subtle shift in the scriptures. When you read the gospels, Jesus moved from doing things for us to doing things through us. For example, in the gospels, the Bible says Jesus started out preaching about the kingdom of God first, and then he told his disciples to start doing the same thing. The Bible tells us that he started healing people first, and then he taught his disciples to do the same thing. He started living in obedience to God first, then he taught and empowered his disciples to live in obedience. Listen now, the highest of the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of men. That means, that means that a lot of the things that need to happen upon this earth is our responsibility. And because God is a God of order, he has chosen, he has decided that everything that happens in this earth, upon this earth, must be done through men. That does not mean that God will not help us, that he will not inspire us, that he will not instruct us, that he will not discipline us, that he will not work uh, in partnership with us. But he has ordained, uh, he has made it a law, uh, he has set the schedule that his, that his goodness and his blessings and his plans will be administered through us, through you who are made in the image of God. That's what it means. So, so now, my brothers and sisters, you know, when I talk about this, in many cases, in many cases, it's not God, that God will not move, but it's that we won't move, right? It's not that God will not help people, but it's that we will not help people. It's not that God won't bring revival. But it's that we will not position ourselves to bring in revival. You know why? Because in some cases, we love this world just as it is. We love the bling bling. We love all these things that many times hinder us from our relationship with God. Huh? It's not that God is not working in the church, but it's that, that we, in many cases, are not working in the church. Huh? You know, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, uh, about other preachers, and I'm sure they've said it about me. I don't know how many times I heard them say, I'm not being fed. I'm not being fed. Listen, being fed is probably not the problem. The problem is that you are constipated because you have not released and you have not put out what you know to good use, and so it gets trapped up on the inside of you, huh? You know, all some people want to do is receive, huh? but they never want to give. But the Bible says, give first, and it will be what? Given to you. huh? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall be what? Poured into your bosom. But you have got to give something, right? You just can't sit up in church and receive and receive and receive. Then on the flip side, you just can't wear yourself out with some task while not putting into practice what you have heard as it concerns the word of God. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you this morning? Huh? Now, now the word for the church in the New Testament, the word for the church in the Greek, the original language is ekklesia. And the word was originally used to describe a gathering of people who were called out to rule or to govern a certain town, city, or province. That's the secular meaning of the word ecclesia. And, and they even discussed, as a governing body, they discussed how to create military strategies. And that's really who the people of God are called to be, an ecclesia. Uh, uh, we are called to bring in, my brothers and sisters, in our area, a heavenly governance. Uh, we are called, we're designed to be militant, like Jesus was, or military in nature, to tear down strongholds 
that the enemy has erected sometimes in us and sometimes in the world around us. We are called to demonstrate that the kingdom of God is near and that one day the kingdom of God will take over. And so everything that represents evil, everything that represents murder and violence and sickness and disease and death and abuse, whether it be physical, mental, or emotional, anything that enslaves people, right? Addictions of all kinds. Anything that presents, prevents people from realizing who Jesus is, who God is, and his plans for us as the ecclesia, as the church, we are called to pray over those things, to speak the truth of God against those things, and to defeat those things in the name of Jesus. So now, so now the scripture in Matthew, the scripture in Matthew that says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, or the one that says, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them. All of that, now that scripture, based upon what I've said today, it ought to take on a different meaning, right? Uh, uh, when you pray, it's not just about yourself. When two or three get together in my name, and whatever they ask for, it was, it's not just about yourself. As a matter of fact, let's look at Matthew. There it is, Matthew 18, chapter. Matthew 18, chapter, verse 18. Look at what Jesus tells his disciples. He says, he said to them, he said, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. See, man's got to initiate it. Why? Because the earth belongs to mankind, right? Let's go to the next verse, please. He said, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they asked for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Let's go to the next one. For where two or three, that's all he said I need. Where two or three gather in my name, he said, there I am with them, the King James, there I am in the midst. Now, now that verse of scripture that right there characterizes God's work in us. Uh, this is, that right there is, is the work of God's kingdom. Binding and loosing. Binding on earth so that it might be bound in heaven. Loosing on earth so that it might be loosed in heaven. Praying and agreeing, right? Coming together with the Lord in our midst. Initiating, huh? Initiating things on earth so that we might receive help from the heavens. This is what we have been called to do, huh? It's not for the short-sighted. It's not for the fickle. It's not for children who don't, who don't want to grow up. It's not for everybody uh, who want to come here and be stroked. It's not for that. It's not for talking about, I mean, the trivial things. And I'm just using this as an example because nobody has said this. It's not about where we ought to put the piano, where we ought to put the flowers. That is not why we're here. And see, while we get to talking about those trivial kinds of things, you got people in this world all around us. And what are they? They are dying. And I'm not just talking about physically dying, but I'm talking about they will eternally be separated from God. They will have their share in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone unless, unless we do what we have been called to do right huh so 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 for those who want to know what it means to live a life of dominion for those of us who want to know what it means to fulfill the purpose for which God has created us huh to to, to, to spread his message around the earth and to subdue the earth to crush the enemy under our feet then you got plenty of scripture that will guide you and lead you into what we ought to be doing as a church a strategic in a very real sense military militant operation where we are aggressive in fighting against the things that Satan has caused to bind our people and blind them to the light of the truth of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have been called, my brothers and sisters, to live a life of 
dominion. You are what? More than a what? Conqueror through him who loved us. Jesus, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now, let's bring that to pass. Amen. Amen. The doors of the church are open. And uh, we invite you to become a part of us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not a perfect church, but striving to be all that God would have us to be. When I say the doors of the church are open, if you don't have a church home, you can walk down that aisle and join right now. We have some ministers who will uh, receive you. Uh, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never of your own volition confessed Jesus with your mouth, confessed that he is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Confess that he, he took your place, died on your behalf, was raised from the dead so that you might be in relationship, in fellowship with the Father. If you've never done that on your own, we invite you, we encourage you to come down to the aisle and do it right now.